we moved to Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C., uh, rented a house. Uh, it was a special government program that got us in that house at all. Uh, medium price dwelling unit, they called it. And we were thankful for it. And we finally decided we, when the rent was going to go up, we might ought to try to purchase. And so we bought a town home. And it scared me. When I sat down in that closing, that place for the closing of that loan, and all those numbers just kept adding up. Now, lots of buyers recognize that sometimes after we make a big purchase, there's the risk of what's called buyer's remorse. You know, there's that time when we reconsider and we wonder, why did I do that? And some of them have created these, you know, ways to try to get us over our fear of buyer's remorse, you know, even ahead of time that keeps us from making the purchase. And so with some things, they'll make, a, you know, a best price guarantee. You know, we'll, we'll match our competitors' best price. We'll do all of these things, and, and they're trying to massage us to help us to, to get beyond our fear of making a big purchase so once we do it, usually we won't go back on it. But, you know, there are car lots and places where they'll give you three days. You could, you could bring it back, you know, if you get a real bad case of buyer's remorse. Like, three days, I'm going to know something is wrong with this thing. Um, I want you to look with me at the last part of Matthew chapter 19 uh, at a passage about the high cost for at least one individual of becoming a disciple of Jesus. Matthew 19, beginning with verse 16. Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There's only one who's good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones, the man inquired. And Jesus replied, do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell all your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Peter answered him, We've left everything to follow you. What, what then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things when the Son of Man sits on His glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or children or fields for my sake 
will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Now, from the introduction and all of my setup, I anticipate you were, are sort of in this mind frame that you know, John's going to talk about us having to give it all. Is that really the point of this encounter? Now, I'm not minimizing that Jesus, and I believe he fully was calling this man to go sell it all, give it to the poor. But you see, if we stop there, I think we've missed the real heart of this passage. The point of the spear is the call to come follow Jesus. This morning in the Sunday school class, Tony shared that uh, in 2011, when he came to be with us early on in one of those sermons, he said, you know, the hardest thing we'll ever do is trust God. That's true. You see, value is not just about what we give for something. It's what we anticipate we will receive from it. Now, there's some things that in our vanity we buy strictly so they will be seen by others and they will attach a sense of value to us. I mean, if two automobiles service over their lifetime basically the same amount to get you from place to place and one's $25,000 more than the other one, why would you pay the higher price? So you, you know, quit preaching and going to meddling, John. I don't want you dealing with my purchasing. We attach value to more than function. I want to ask for a raise of hands of how many of you have gone to yard sales or how many of you have had yard sales. Isn't it amazing how value shifts depending on which side of the table you're on? <laughs> you know, when you're selling your junk and you put your bottom dollar price, the last thing you want is somebody offering you a quarter of that. You know, unless you just don't really attach value to it and whatever you get out of it, that's fine. You know, then it's, it's fine. If there's still a little bit of sentimental value, see, even there's that phrase. You know, I, I attach these memories to that thing. You ever watch the show American Pickers? You know, these two guys driving all over the country, uh, buying junk to sell in Nashville or their store up in the Midwest. Uh, And what's amazing to me is the psychology of them trying to show the seller that they value that item, not just based on what it can resell for, but the story behind it. What meaning is attached to this? Which store in the local community did that sign come from and what's the story about the owner of that store? You see, the story is sometimes worth more than the item. And when it connects to the item, then you're connected to that history. For this young man... I anticipate that his sense of wealth connected him with 
pleasure, power. And likely most of all, freedom from any authority. Except his own desires. He could do what he chose to do. And you know what? That's the American dream. To be rich enough to do what I want, when I want, how I want. No questions asked. Those are the cultural waters we swim in. That's the, the cultural flood of, of all of our television driven by sales. How highly do we value following Jesus? Is the question that I think this encounter is included in, in Matthew and Mark, and I didn't check, probably in Luke. These gospelers, these tellers of the story of Jesus, uh, John tells us toward the close of his gospel, you know, there were so many things written that you know, the, the world at that time didn't have enough books to hold them all, or enough things that Jesus did that, that they couldn't all be written. So if there's so much it couldn't all be written, and yet we've chosen these things, there's some selectivity that the Holy Spirit guides those men thinking about their communities of faith that they're using this material to build up and strengthen and they're using to equip them to carry this message of Jesus yet to others who've never heard it. Why this story is included when others were left out. I think it serves as something of an archetype, a model of the place of struggle for many human beings. What's it going to cost me? Some have said we all walk around with this invisible tattoo on our forehead. Maybe if there were a special light, it would show up that says, what's in it for me? And good salespeople, good motivators, good recruiters always anticipate that's our question, and they're going to do a good job of answering it. And if they're really good, they're going to anticipate our objections and help us get beyond those without us ever verbalizing them. They want us to attach more value to the item than what it costs us. So then we can go away and be proud of it and we can say we got a good deal. We get the functional value and the sense of making a good deal. But see, all that's transactional. When we start bringing that language into relationship, then it, it gets really pretty crazy, doesn't it? Steve and Judy entered into a covenant relationship. How many years ago? 26? Now, there's some folks, when they get married, they have prenuptial agreements. You know what that's about, don't you? That's about money. It's about what they brought into the relationship and they're determining before they ever say I do that there's some things I don't. And that's a contract. That's a transaction. That's lining everything up and 
saying this is how it will be dealt with and we're both in agreement and so we can become partners in this corporation called a marriage. But you see, a covenant relationship is about trust. It, it's about a commitment. It's about a recognition that with Deborah, I'm a much better man. Yes, I know many of you silently said amen. And it's very true. But it's, it's about relationship. It's not just about our possessions. It, it's about us on this journey together. And whether it's giving or sharing or obeying or uh, disciple making or any of the seven journeys, they really all do sort of Bring us right back to that first one, trusting. Is Jesus trustworthy? Is this ongoing walk with him, this journey with him, really worth it all? But far beyond the dollar value, this freedom factor. Is it worth me yielding my will to his will? Especially when I don't understand why he's calling me to do that. See, yielding is easy when I understand. You know, if, if there's an a, uh, intersection that has a yield sign from my side, and I see a fully loaded concrete truck, SRM, Smyrna Ready Mix, truck coming the other way, it's easy for me to yield. I know my frontier will not survive, and I probably won't. Will I yield where I don't understand? And that's largely going to rest in the value I place in the relationship. Do I believe that God knows more about what I need, what's best for me? Do I believe God knows more about that than I do? Enough that I'll say, yes, Lord. That I'll be like Peter and I'll get out of the boat. One commentator said about this response of this young man, this may be the saddest verse in the Bible. Verse 25, or rather verse 22, when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. But you see, verse 25 raises a different audience. There's this conversation between Jesus and this one individual. But Matthew turns his focus to the conversation that happens after that between Jesus and his disciples. They've overheard this conversation. And Matthew tells us they were greatly astonished. And, and they ask, well... Who then can be saved? And Jesus reminds them, you know, 
This is impossible for people. You ever heard those wild brain stories about camel going through the eye of a needle being this little short gate into Jerusalem and the camel gets down on his knees and walks through there? That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about a sewing needle. You know, even the biggest upholstery needle got a pretty small eye. And you don't get a camel through there. With God, some things are possible. No. God can pull this off. Now, in my rational self, I want to know how in the world. And that's not the issue. Will I trust him to do what he wants to do? Him to do what is best. Peter answered, we've left everything to follow you. What then will be, what will there be for us? And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who's left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake, We'll receive a little bit more. No, 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 no. God's still in the multiplying business. A hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life, but many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Do we believe? Now, there's the rational sense of belief that, you know, well, if God chose to, he could do that. Trust pushes us to say, yes. He not only can, but he will. And that's the place where for this young man, it doesn't happen. At this point, his story is never revisited, and we don't know what his long term decision was. But at this moment, he goes away sad. One of the other Gospels tells us Jesus loved him. This isn't a hard, calculated negotiation. This isn't like your Neighbor who's trying to get you down on that used car you're trying to sell to the last single dollar you'll, you know, what, what's your bottom price? This is Jesus understanding what's standing in the way. Can I be personal for a few minutes? It's not going to be scolding. It's, it's transparent. Um, Nathan's class got real personal a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago now, uh, on anxieties. Uh, I went through a stretch of about three weeks where somewhere between 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock in the morning, I was waking up almost in a panic. I leave on Wednesday of this week for two weeks in Africa and then get back and 
uh, have a couple of days at home and then I drive up to Kentucky to do a week-long training and you know for a guy who says call his title the team's giving him this title global coach that sounds like the perfect scenario uh, Brian my son-in-law is with us and he's given me a new tag for what I experienced it, it's called the imposter syndrome uh, he found out that uh, doctoral students at some point in their studies typically go through this where you wake up afraid that people are going to ask you a question or a series of questions you can't answer related to your field of study and you're going to be shown to be the fraud that you're afraid within yourself you are some of you are grinning because you you've, you've gone far enough into studies and professional uh, categories that you know what I'm talking about. Well, there are two big projects that I'll be working on when I'm in Africa. One is a video uh, production of some African trainers that'll be pulled together. We got this crazy harebrained idea of six world-class African trainers teaching the five same lessons and those being video recorded, and then we're going to chop them up and make five sessions that will move back and forth between these six guys teaching these lessons. Now, who came up with such a harebrained idea? See, that's what you do when you're in a room with Jerry Trousdale trying to come up with six proposals for a grant that a foundation has offered if you'll tell them what you're going to do with them. And then there was another one. One, one of the things that we know with disciple-making movements that's so important is mobilizing intercession, lots of prayer. The more people you can get praying uh, about the specifics of disciple-making movement, typically the more the breakthroughs happen. Now, there's always incredible spiritual warfare, and that's the reason... Intercession is so important because the real spiritual dynamics happen in the heavenlies. They don't happen here on earth. And so there was this harebrained idea of coming up with a phone app that Africans who have smartphones could tech, you know, type in their prayer request and it would immediately go out to thousands of intercessors around the world who've downloaded the app to be intercessors. Yes, I was the one who suggested that. And so I've warned the rest of my teammates, if James is out of pocket and you're asked to help with a foundation grant proposal, be prepared to help do whatever you suggest. So these two big projects that I know relatively nothing about how to make them happen got to be on my plate. And they're not happening one at a time with a, you know, a month to recover after they're finished. No, they're all happening right at the same time and they've got the same deadline next spring. And so I'm waking up terrified. You know, I can think about a thousand details that haven't been nailed down and they all need to happen before I leave. And when will they happen? And, and why don't I get up from here right now? It's, it's, so what if it's 3 o'clock in the morning? You can knock some of these things out. You know, nobody else is up and they can't help you with it right now. Wouldn't appreciate your text message or your phone call. And then there's this swimming sea of God's word saying, okay, John, are you going to trust me? Are you going to practice what you preach? Or are you just going to lay here and squirm and wear the bed out in yourself? In reflecting on this through Nathan's class and Angela's testimony last week, I, I must confess that I've relied too much on my sense of my abilities and my training 
and my experience. Because you see, in these two areas, I, I don't have much experience to fall back on. With the phone app, I got zero, zip, zilch, nada. If it wasn't for Byron Summerdahl and Acklin Avenue, his company, I, I could have honestly said, James, I don't have a clue how to make this happen. You gotta find somebody else. But no, I knew Byron. And of course, when I called Byron to talk about it, he said, I'm coming to Tennessee. This was back earlier this year, and we can, we can start the process. And so now I'm spending thousands of dollars from a grant to help create something that I can't explain some basic questions to other people. And there's that inner fear of I will be exposed. As not able. I want to remind you of verse 26. With John, this is impossible. But with God, these things are possible. Do I believe that? Will I rest in that? Now, one of the reasons these seven journeys are called journeys is because, you know, we, there was a time when I, I'd beat myself up. You know, John, you've been at this a long time. Well, haven't you gotten this down yet? If you're that hard on yourself, please, I encourage you. I beg you. I urge you. See it as a journey. Realize that, that God is in us producing capacity. Because of some of the openness here, I started to share aspects of this with our shepherds and with Angela after the class last week. And, and then on Monday, I was emboldened to share it with my team. We had a, a half a day meeting. And I got some help on another project that had gotten pushed on me the last minute that I had no clue how to do. And then my team leader reminded me and the rest of the team you know we go out training churches and individuals and organizations saying God loves to do the extraordinary through ordinary people because then he gets all the credit well guess what if these things work out he's going to get all the credit because It wasn't about me. It wasn't about my abilities. It wasn't about my training. It wasn't about my experience. I'm an ordinary person. God's called to an extraordinary opportunity. And you know what? We're all on this journey together. When you're feeling most vulnerable and least adequate, that's the place for your faith, your trust in God to carry you through. And it's the invitation from us to Him to bring growth.